with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. We seem to be enjoying some background music. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. We seem to be enjoying some background music. My name is Reverend Jennifer Innes. We don't need the time delay that happens with like sports and music events we to like make sure there's no censoring or with, like sports and music events we to like But hang sure in with no us. Censoring. Everything is in beta. We will figure it out. I have faith. But hang in with us. Everything is in beta. We will figure it out. I have faith. You know, there used to be this little exhibit at the Boston Science Museum where you could you know, there used to be dial a phone, get onto the phone and, and talk into it and then hear your voice back. to the phone and, and talk your voice back. <laughs> it was one of the oddest experiences I will offer. Now we're good? You! All right. Oh, we were hearing the Facebook stream. All right. Hey, Facebook. Hey, nice to see you too. All right. Now, welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is the Reverend Jennifer Innes. It is my great joy to be the minister with this congregation in all seasons and all phases of life. This is a beloved community striving to live into its mission of embracing freedom, loving wholeheartedly, growing in mind, body, and spirit, and adding to the healing of the world. We welcome people of all ethnicities and races, sexual orientations, gender identities, social and economic situations, politics and abilities. We advocate for human rights for everyone, and we strive to be good stewards of this earth. I just want to pause in the moment here. There's just been so much in the heart uh, I don't know if you've experienced this this week, but I have in terms of the life of this congregation. And I just want to pause and say how good it is to be together, how good it is to be with, to be gathered in this moment, and how precious we are in this life as these desperately mortal beings that we are. It is so good to be here. We recognize the network of relationships of which we are a part including the ground on which we gather, for this is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They and other nations were here long before the first European settlers came down the Illinois River, and we honor the Peoria people for who they were and for who they are today. I want to thank you for joining us in person and online. We realize how precious it is to come together, to be with other people, to expand our circles of care. So if you are new, please help us get to know you. 
We have plenty of name tags. We have room for all the questions. I want to invite folks to stay for conversation and coffee in Fellowship Hall after the service if you're in person. Uh, if you're online, stay on Zoom for a bit and chat there. Uh, in this moment, I also want to remind folks to set your respective devices to worship mode, whether silent or vibrate. And that includes, in this day and age, remember your watch as well. Don't forget the watches. Very important, these things. So I have a few notes for today. Uh, firstly, that next Sunday is Easter. It is Easter Sunday coming up. I think we might actually have spring. Oh my goodness, it might be rainy though, but that's okay. That's spring too. For those of you who are newer to the congregation, you might have noticed that we don't often cite Christian scripture or specifically name Jesus all that often. So you might be wondering, how does a Unitarian Universalist congregation do Easter? I'm always fascinated to find out myself. So come and find out and bring your friends, and we will do this good thing together. It is a lovely way to offer a message of just powerful renewal in this time. And I also would love to include readers in the service, especially folks for whom Easter and the teachings of Jesus are particularly meaningful. I really want to invite you to, to join me if you'd like. And also... After the service, because we love the good pagan things too, we have a great egg hunt. Rain or shine, Jesse and the volunteers will find a way, whatever the weather. And family and friends are certainly welcome for that too. And now I invite a member of the annual campaign forward for their invitation today. So, yes, today is a kickoff to the annual campaign, and our team is thrilled to be able to bring that to you, and we certainly look forward to your participation. Um, and yes, we are going to provide a meal today. It comes from the Mediterranean, no, that's not right, the Jerusalem Cafe, which is Mediterranean. So it will be a unique experience for all of us. At the end of the serving table are some things for kids that may not want to participate from the Mediterranean Cafe. But we hope you all enjoy that. And yes, we thank you all for bringing desserts. That will be the finishing touch to our meal. And so yes, let's go get them and fill out those pledge forms, et cetera, that you're going to hear about. And yes, we'll all continue to support this wonderful church. All right. Thank you, Martha. Now, our opening hymn is Hymn 1000. It is in the Teal Hymnal, if you'd like to have the music. This is our opening hymn for the month, so we can get really good at it. Now, this morning we have a bit of a different version that's, the, that's a singing with a video. Uh, and it's thanks to Paul Thompson and the Unitarian Universalist Church of the Palouse in Moscow, Idaho. Uh, and that's their recording of this is how I really started to hear and learn this hymn. And if you were here way back when, I used this recording a number of times in my first year with this congregation when we did all the recorded services. Remember that? Yeah, it's good to sing together now. Yes. So please rise in body or spirit and join me for singing Morning Has Come.
way scared to move this microphone. I think it's going to fall apart. Good morning. Building speaks, not in voices of stone, but in the hum of conversation, a flesh and bone gathering, nearly mystical at times. Almost we sense mental chains shattering. Almost we hear birds resting free of their cages and the walls long hidden in the corners of our mind, walls so defining, hold us fast. Until together our voices rise, trust blooming, until there is a sky blue unending. Judgments wither like cut flowers, and then, and love, love is the ground on which we dance, singing liberation. So it was, so it is, so it will be. Now let's dance. I invite Abby Price forward for our chalice. Love is the aspiration, the spirit that moves and inspires this faith we share. Rightly understood, love can nurture our spirits and transform the world. May the flame of this chalice honor and embody the power and blessing of love we need, the love we give, the love we are challenged always to remember and to share. invite us into a time of reflection, of pausing, of being present. We get to have this time and be held with the gift of music, the gift of simply being together. And during our music for meditation, you are welcome to come forward like candles with us. If you are online, I invite you to let these candles welcome you as well. Let us enter into our music for meditation.
now is the time we set aside for the sharing of the joys, the sorrows, the names, the milestones among us. I want to offer a first note of thanks to everyone who was part of the first ever drag and paint event here at the church on Friday night. Drag performances, painting, we had a lot of fun. Thank you. And a little art. We have a joy from Gary Hall. He assisted with the swearing in of a new citizen on Thursday. And I think he reported there were about 84 new citizens sworn in on that day. Now we turn to sorrow. We offer condolences to the family and friends, given the sad news of a few deaths in our community. We recognize that Lori Russell Chapin died on March 13th. Her visitation and memorial will be on April 5th at the Davison Fulton Woolsey Wilton Funeral Home. I know she was a close friend to many here in Peoria. Karen Folster died Sunday, March 17th. Her daughter, Lisa, said Karen had been fighting cancer for over six months and then declined after a fall. We'll have the details for her memorial later. We want to offer sympathy to Shirley Cunningham for the death of her committed friend, Don Paul. Don died on March 19th, and he had a beautiful funeral at United Presbyterian Church yesterday. In our larger world, we have another sorrow. We offer sympathy to Heather McMeekin's friend and community in Macomb. The friend was wounded in her home and lost her young child in the police response. Yeah. Yeah, the news is really, it's really awful. The community is deeply hurt and struggling. We offer sympathy to those who died in the attack on the concert in Moscow in Russia. Such a loss is heartbreaking for us all. I want to offer a note of witness and solidarity in this week as this week leads into the Transgender Day of Visibility, which concludes on March 31st. And yes, we'll include recognizing that a bit along with Easter. And we have a note among our world religions. Today is Palm Sunday in the Christian tradition, marking Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem. In the Jewish tradition, this weekend marks Purim. It is a day to celebrate the survival of the Persian Jews. And the month of fasting and deepening for Ramadan continues for the Islamic community. Let us hold one more moment together, for in our circle we have room for all the joys and the sorrows and the names and the milestones that are among us. Let us hold one more moment in quiet. Shalom, salam, amen. 
I invite Jesse forward for our story of the day. Our story today is Lydia Says Yes. You might be hearing yes a lot around here. I bet you all come up with some pretty great ideas. Ideas about how to fix things in the world. Ideas about how to make things a little better. Sometimes when you have a great idea, it can be hard to commit to it. To give that idea the room and the energy it needs to grow, to become. It can be hard to say yes to our ideas. This winter, I asked our church historian, Kathy Carter, about someone from our church's past. I just needed a little fact confirmation. But I found out that this person was a shining example of saying yes to good ideas. This person was Lydia Moss Bradley. Does that name sound familiar? Maybe there's a university in town. Maybe there's a famous street nearby. Hmm. Lydia and her husband Tobias arrived in Peoria in 1847. They said yes to coming here in part because it was important to Lydia that they live in a state that did not allow slavery. Peoria has been a safe place for many to land. Together, Laura and Tobias had six children, but unfortunately, none of them survived childhood. Her daughter, Laura, lived the longest until she was a freshman in high school. And then, three years after Laura died, Tobias, Lydia's husband, died following a carriage accident. Lydia was alone in Peoria. But she did have resources, and she had a lot of good ideas. Driven by her universalist values, Lydia continued to conduct the businesses that her husband left behind. And she made it her mission to keep saying yes. Lydia wanted to help children in Peoria that didn't have families. So she said yes to the home for the friendless and gave them a building they didn't have to pay to use. The Home for the Friendless is now called the Children's Home of Illinois, an organization still doing great work in our community. Lydia knew that having outdoor spaces was important for everyone in this town. So she said yes to donating over 100 acres to the city and said they had to create a park board to take care of that land. We still enjoy Laura Bradley Park and the whole park system here in Peoria. Lydia continued to do business in Peoria, but she wasn't just happy buying and selling and making a profit. She knew she had to care for the land that she owned. She said yes to improving it from planting the elm and oak trees along Bradley Avenue before she sold it, to researching how to improve land and bringing in experimental potassium and improving swampland to become profitable farming land. Lydia knew that with education, the people in this town could improve their lives 
provide for their families easier. So Lydia said yes to bringing a watchmaking company into town and creating a school for folks here to learn that skill. That further led her into the importance of education. And she said yes to starting Bradley Polytechnic College, a place where girls and women were welcomed alongside boys and men to learn with them at a time when that was rare in this country. And one of the biggest yeses Lydia Moss Bradley said was to our church. In our old building downtown, we had a mortgage. There was a big bill that we had to pay for our building and the land it was on. And the person who held that bill had to decide one day that he needed all of that money right now. And the congregation tried, and we fundraised, and we looked in the couch cushions, and we saved money. But unfortunately, we just couldn't come up with what was needed. we were going to lose our church home. But Lydia knew that our church was important in Peoria. She knew that here, people were encouraged to be generous, to treat people with equity, to work for justice. So Lydia Moss Bradley said yes to the Universalist Society of Peoria, and she donated $30,000 to pay that mortgage in full. For a time after that, our church was even called the Tobias Bradley Memorial Church after her husband. There were many, many more yeses that Lydia Moss Bradley said in her life. Yes to the library, yes to an opera house, yes to bringing a hospital system to Peoria. Those St. Francis nuns needed a place and she helped. I encourage you to learn a little more about her amazing life and the impact that she made Lydia's was a life of acting on her ideas, of making a difference, of saying yes. I wonder how some of Lydia's yeses affect your life. I wonder what you will say yes to in this church, in this town, in this whole world. The kiddos are invited to join me for religious education. The offering we receive each Sunday, I want to offer, it might be every Sunday, but let it not be a stale habit. It is an opportunity to recommit to this place and to this people. It is to offer an affirmation. It is to say and affirm what we value most. With our gifts freely given, may we say yes to the values of our faith and help practice of practice in the world. 
Part of what we also do with our financial gifts is share a portion of our abundance with the world through our Share the Plate practice. Each week, one-third of the undesignated offering goes to one of our monthly recipients. This month, it is East Bluff Community Center Food Pantry, which they operate four Sundays out of, uh, four Saturdays, excuse me, per month uh, in the morning, and the folks who come are able to be served and select from a range of food and will leave after they've had some breakfast with uh, some meat, vegetable, things to take home. So the folks who are of low income and unhoused really need this kind of service in our world in this time. And volunteers manage this, so our donations really go a long way in order to serve and make the life better for our neighbors. So again, for Share the Plate, two-thirds of the undesignated offering goes to the church, one-third to the named agency. I want to invite you to use the offering for our envelopes for the use. Uh, see the QR code in the order of service. And thank you so much for all of your generosity in all the forms that it takes to help make this congregation and its ministry possible. And now I invite the ushers to please come forward. Our reading is a reflection from the Reverend Sam Trumbor. So I invite you now into a time of reflection and gratitude, renewal and hope. What an unearned blessing to delight in the calming presence of this place, to hear the robin's song again at daybreak, to feel the warmth in this room, to enjoy the promise of summer coming and coming eventually. Each moment of wakefulness has so many gifts that offer energy and delight, and yet too often they seem unavailable as the weight of our troubles press down upon us. The threats to our well-being, real or exaggerated, feel like mosquitoes in the night looking for a place to land. Minds become captive to rising floodwaters, forceful, murky, threatening, ominous. Even in moments of great danger, the direction of attention is a choice. Fear can dominate the mind, binding it like a straitjacket, or love can unbind it and open it to resource and opportunity. The soil of the mind can be watered with kindness. Thorns can be removed one by one to appreciate the buds ready to flower. Great possibilities await us, even if all we can see is the cliff before us. 
the grandeur of life of which we are a part, scatters rainbows in every direction, even as the deluge approaches. Holding reality and possibility together is the holy, hope-filled work of humanity. If, if we choose it again and again in love. Let us get so grounded and connected in the presence of the world and the strength of the earth with the song, My Roots Go Down. Kathy, please. The lyrics will be up on the screen while Kathy and Heather offer the music. Thank you. One of the great gifts of spring is the chance for me to feed my love of finding everyday miracles. You know, church life in these spring months can be so full. I can get to May feeling like I missed the whole season. Oh, but I want to pause and wonder and connect with some of the glory of the world. But when I slow down ever so slightly, I find it. I love to see what emerges. I mean, daffodils are good, crocuses are lovely, the buds on the trees, the quality of light in the spring dawn. That itself is something. But also in the spring, I enjoy seeing what emerges thanks to legacy, to what emerges from the people in the past 
that have made choices that continue to inspire and expand into our world now. I am a lover of legacy, of institutions, of vision from those who operated from hope and possibility and wanted those people of the past wanting to set the tone and establish a foundation that leads to opportunity, to more. I got to enjoy a lot of that growing up in New England with beautiful architecture, noting the distinctions between the theological choices between churches that had stained glass and had certain images and churches that had clear glass so that you could look out into the world. So many different choices of people who have benefited, those of us who have the legacy of benefiting from parks and protected land. I want to find those places wherever I go. And in the smaller scale, it can be as modest as one farm's heirloom agriculture and conserving certain heritage breeds of animals. I mean, it can be really small, this kind of wonder and discovery. And in between, everything in between has layers of history and populations showing up and continuing to feed into the community, to nurture the people who, are, who keep coming, who are generations away from where it started. So someone such as Lydia Moss Bradley, that's one of those wonders in the spring, I find. That presence as she was in the last half of the 1800s, both by nature and nurture, how she understood both the practical and the possible, how to invest in business and also foster an environment for children to grow and learn, for adults to grow and learn. And that a church such as this fed the mind and spirit in alignment with this vision she had. You know, she was some, we recognize that in her life, that development and aspiration and simply living was not easy. It was not just a continuous rising path onward and upward. She knew that better than so many, given the deep losses of her children and her husband. But she also was one of those people who listened, too. She heard from her friends who said, don't wait to found something that will come into existence after you die. Do the work now and see what happens. And she did. And she did. As a person getting to know Peoria, learning more about Lydia has been part of that kind of spring emergence for me this year. And it's such a gift to savor the benefit of all that is in and around this community because of her good work. And certainly one of those being the presence and existence of this church. In a moment when we suffer from efforts to dismantle voices and votes and human rights and education and so much more, we have an opportunity to recognize and perpetuate powerful yes. So as we kick off the start, the official start to our annual campaign, I want to bring back some of what I was talking about in January with the church that says yes. I'm going to come back to that for a minute. Because that service inspired the theme. So let's refresh. Because when I say yes, I mean possibility, connection, our capacity to shift the world, that we can indeed love our neighbor even when we really don't like them, that we can indeed love our earth even when we struggle to know how to do so. 
I mean the freeing power of yes, even when we have no idea what will happen. And the yes in this moment is universal, but it's not only a yes. It is a little bit different than the category of healthy boundaries. Yes is also saying, I have space. Personal space, emotional space, mental needs, relationships, and more, that we are saying yes to being present and knowing exactly where we are. And allowing at the same time that no is a complete sentence. It's okay. And we also, in saying yes to our beloved community of the world, we say no to injustice. We say no to certain work. Uh, we take up the message of Dr. King's work, for example, uh, as one of many who articulated the yes and the no around racial justice, economic justice, and so much more. Our work with pride and becoming welcoming is saying no to bias, no to dehumanizing people because of their gender and sexual orientation, and it's saying yes to love and becoming our full selves. There is a yes, and there is also no, because we want to know where that yes is going to take us. Kwame Alexander, in his TED Talk from 2017, The Power of Yes, says, when we say yes, we allow our minds to create a reality for ourselves rather than others, letting others create it for us. This is an invitation to imagination, to collective the collective care based in love that depends on each of us. Alexander says, here's what I know. The no's are a part of life. I think we got to learn to embrace the no's. They get they're going to, they get they're going to happen. It's the way the universe works. We got a lot of no. But here's the wonderful thing. Once all the no's come to the party, they go home and they're tired. What's left is the yes, and how many yeses do you need? You just need one. The one that has the power beyond all that no. So members and friends of this congregation were engaged in a conversation of yes, of vision and visibility and vitality for the next year, for the next five years, for the next 10 years. And the planning team that brought all that information together is still needing to come together to finalize that report. But let me share a few of the themes. What are the priorities for the next five years? There certainly is a desire to increase the scope of the congregation, both in ministry and in numbers and capacity. We are moving in that direction. We want to continue to build, uh, to build on all of the good that has already been happening in terms of the visibility, presence in the community. We want to, we want to have fun. The congregation was saying they want to have fun. Let me tell you, this is a good thing. And it's a good sign because a system that can embrace fun and joy, which are different, and embrace imagination and creativity is one that can keep doing so. It's got a nice perpetual motionness to it. It's a good indicator of health and opportunity and prosperity in the spirit, which is, of course, the best way to be ready for all the potential of bringing it out into the world and making manifest the vision and the mission of the congregation. We want to expand. Ooh, more staff. I love that word on that there, more staff. Yes. But also more, more wonderful development of volunteers, of leaders. Because we depend on, the congregation exists because, let me tell you, that lunch that we are going to enjoy later today happens because a fabulous team of volunteers really said, yes, we're going to have a wonderful lunch this year. 
And we also want to expand on our interfaith connections, our social justice connections, continue and grow this good work, and also continue to be a presence around climate justice as well, and really do some practical work with that, as well as some good messaging. Those are some of the few, the few themes that came together. And simply also want to be a deeper community, a genuine place that has been the case for a long time, but, but to do even better. Every time the congregation has someone new come in, the community is a little bit different. So how do we keep being with each other? Every week, it is a little bit different. Every, this gathering will never be the same as it, as it is, right? We want to take good care of being a place and an embrace and a welcome. But also one of the yeses I'm going to go a little deeper into. In early February, we hosted Heather Vickery from the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee. She reminded us of the realities of fascism and its emergence in our country and how it is coming down upon us. And she recruited us. I mean, this was a recruiting moment that she came, and it was great. And she recruited this congregation and many socially progressive folks in, as she could meet in that day in Peoria for being part of the effort to support trans and non-binary people and their families as they're trying to leave from difficult and unsafe places in other parts of the country and to find a safer place. And the congregation responded so well. Peoria is one of the ideal places in this country where people uh, in a moment when people are losing their human rights and their access to health care and their ability to keep their children. Okay, that one really ticks me off, let me just say. There is a concerted effort to erase trans and non-binary folk from existence. And those who gathered after the service demonstrated the imagination and resources that are needed to be so supportive in this kind of moment. Now, I realize things have been a little bit quiet since that first weekend in February. These things do take time to grow into a network. And given the confidential nature, because we are concerned about safety and security, much of it won't be known or recorded. But it is powerful and needed. But some of you may wonder, and in fact, a few have asked, why would we be so so much part of this effort in supporting trans and non-binary folks. Why us? Why would this congregation do that? And maybe there was a little bit of that question is, is a concern about being so visible. You know, would the congregation be a little bit at risk? So part of a yes, a world-shifting kind of yes, is how the work and the outcome is, is something unknown and not entirely comfortable. We know the, the yes might be worthy of us if it shows that there is a little growing, forming edge and a little like, I'm not entirely sure what's going to happen. But then there is the seriousness of what's happening with trans and non-binary folks that led the UN to consider them an internally displaced group in our country. I'm still trying to understand the gravity of that and its implications. We are part of a global concern that is personal as well as local. You know, the commitment, and it's not just local like Peoria local, it's local like here local. Because the commitment to welcome folks who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, questioning, intersex, asexual, and more, to welcome trans and non-binary folks is for us too. It is for right here. It's for parents in our congregation 
who are striving to protect and raise their children. I mean, the population we're trying to serve in this moment is us as well. It's for grandparents who want to connect with their grandchildren. It's for elders who want to connect with their nieces and nephews, the young people in their lives who are very much exploring and wondering and trying to make sense of identity and orientation and so much more. It is for adults, too, among us, who are coming into new understanding and new understandings and identities of their own. This, yes, is global, local, personal, and congregational. I would offer, it is fair to say that the founders of this congregation, people in history such as Lydia Moss Bradley, would not have predicted a drag story time in the church or drag queens dancing in fellowship hall. I'm just going to say, this is true. We are an entirely different world. And I have had the opportunity to watch our congregations as growing up in Unitarian Universalism. I've seen how our congregations in the span of just my lifetime evolve and grow in these areas. We can have this conversation about trans rights thanks to all those in other congregations who have had the audacity to name themselves and advocate for their children and for themselves. There's so many places where this congregation has said, has, has ch been challenged and not known where to go and has still said yes. I want to name just a little bit more as we finish. It strikes me that within the lives of, our, of the members of this congregation, within the lifetimes here, this congregation has had its own challenges of figuring out how to move forward, such as with the great conflict over the Vietnam War, a financial crisis that came around the same time that led to efforts to stabilize and sustain the congregation, a benefit we enjoy today. Within the past 20 years, we had member Les Kenyon drew from the beautiful historic building in downtown Peoria that was not going to serve the congregation for much longer and design a space, this space, that is spacious and has room for fellowship has room for worship, has room for children and youth, and is accessible. And it retains the beauty as expressed in stained glass and curved pews. Gosh, you know, I walk in here, I feel like it's a hug all the time. I love the curved pews. And for the members, the members who said yes in choosing this land with its forest, added a whole ministry of being caretakers of our environment in a very real way, along with our efforts with climate crisis. We've been saying yes in so many ways. And there's further yeses that will also challenge us, not just the one that's going forward around the trans liberation effort, one of the ones that came up during the, the vision and planning, it's going to be a little more of a challenge, is to live into that sign out front, Black Lives Matter, and the related concerns around race and culture and religion. That yes, that yes is a particular mystery to unpack within Unitarian Universalism. But the work we do there the work we have done, the work we will do, that will also feed the generations to come. The great work, the great yes that we will be saying, uh, responding to, is nothing less and nothing more than the practice of being a beloved community in this modern age. 
It is undiscovered country. But everything that we have received, everything that we are drawing from, equips us. Shows that we have the possibility, that we have this gathered strength to do so. And not just for the benefit of the congregation, but for the world. That we can add our voices and our wonder and our affirmation to say, yes, everyone should have a voice. Everyone should have a vote. Everyone is a human and has rights. And yes, we are also taking care of this beloved world, too. The promise of yes is our potential as much as it is relational, our commitments, what we are worthy, what, we, what is worth our time and our effort and our care for those who will come back after us that we will never meet. This is what we get to live into today, this promise of yes. So let us begin. Amen. I invite you to rise and body your spirit for our closing hymn, This Little Light of Mine. We have added a couple of verses, so check out the slide. It seemed like when we started to sing this in other moments, we only go with the ones in the hymnal, that we are just getting going by the time it's over. So we're going to sing a little longer on this one. Extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. We all emerge from, dwell within, and are transformed by and called back to love. May our minds be humbled before this mystery. May our hearts grow hopeful by it. And may we be sustained by this love always. Our worship is ended. Let our service begin. <laughs> 